Um, so tonight we're going to be going through, like I said, chapter three and onward. We did chapter one and two last Tuesday. Don't worry if you missed it. I'm going to show you right here. We got you covered. YouTube, I uploaded the first two chapters. You can see part one right here. Oh, I'm pretty happy. We've already got some good views on this. So if you're if you're checking it out, I really appreciate it. If you've watched the video or if you leave a comment or like or subscribe on YouTube, appreciate it. It's been awesome. Um, I'm just having fun with it. I was going to do it anyway. So just doing it live with uh, all of you and having a, a conversation in the chat has just been super fun and rewarding. So I want to keep that up. Um, and thanks again for coming by. So we'll quickly recap a little bit of what we did in chapter one and two, and then we'll just jump back into the book. Um, <clears throat> also, <laughs> just wanted to note, I did post what we did last week on GitHub. You can find it at Tom McGurl, Learn Rust Live. You can also see my GitHub handle above me here if you missed that. I also have my Twitter URL, so go ahead and find it on Twitter, and you'll see when I post and go live. So if you follow me there, you'll get those updates. JavaScript Mick, go Russells. Woo! Yeah, we're going to be Rust stations after you know no time at all. I'm, I'm expecting today we'll be making a little more progress, learning a little bit more core stuff. There might be a little less coding, but we're going to go into it anyway, and it's going to be fun. So thank you for stopping by. So here we have the GitHub, again, the YouTube, and here's the book. And so I have the table of contents here. You can see last time we did chapters one and chapters two and those you can find here in our projects it's going to kind of map out what we did in chapters one and two so should be fun clam watson in the chat what up all right so let's just go ahead and kind of recap a little bit of what we did so i'm going to pull up my termo here um so last week we got started with the book, kind of a little forward, a little intro to see what Rust is all about, right? To figure out, you know, what it's used for. There's a nice forward by the authors here. You can find that here. And we read through that. We read through the first chapter a little bit, got through that, implemented the programming. We basically programmed out a guessing game in Rust, which is super fun. Um, so we'll run that. So we learned a little bit about cargo. We got kind of like a head first jump in, right? So we got to kind of jump in and see what it's like. Uh, now today is gonna to be a little bit more deeper dive into the concepts that we may or may not have already used, just so we can have a better foundation to build off of in future chapters. So super excited about that. Um, but what I wanted to do here is kind of just go over the, the program that we wrote in the last uh, last week. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send, send myself over here so I'm out of your way. Oh, we'll switch it up, a little flip on you. Ooh. But so here I have the uh, the guessing game program. Um, and so we, we learned about importing. So importing stuff, some of it from the standard library, some of it from other dependencies, which we are tracking in our cargo TOML file. Uh, not that cargo TOML file, this cargo TOML file. And we had our dependencies here. That's our lock file. Where's our t t cargo TOML? There we go. Here we had our random number dependency. And so Cargo generated out a folder structure for us to use. It generated out some boilerplate. It gave us our TOML file where we specified random number. Uh, and then we had our main file where we wrote our code. Now to go over a little bit about what we did last time, we imported the random number generator uh, and we imported from the standard library the compare function that would allow us to do a match. And so basically if we were to run through this code a little bit, we learned about print how the exclamation point means that it's a macro. So it's not just a low level function, it's a macro, which is made up of multiple functions behind the scene that do some type checking for, for you. So that'll be great. Um, we have secret number here where we're actually using our random number generator to generate a random number between one and 100. So that's gonna be great. Um, and then we coded this first and then we actually wrapped it in a loop. So we'll go through it a little bit. We have our loop, the loop is gonna mark an infinite loop, right? And the way that we get out of or break out of an infinite loop is to use a break. And so what we do first is we ask the user for their input. We use a mutable variable. So we covered a little bit mutable ability and immutability. We'll go more into that today in chapter three, I believe. Um, we created a new string. We read from our standard in. So we read from the, from the input of the terminal. So what the user types. And then what we do is we try to parse whatever they type as an integer. Again, this is a number guessing game. So if I type something, it's gonna come in as a string, but we're gonna parse it as an integer. And we did that using our trim parse. And we 
basically marked the type. So we type annotated it with an unsigned 32-bit integer that made sure that the string was a 32-bit integer. And here we used a match case uh, to check if that parse was successful. We return the number. And if it wasn't, we print out an error and we continue. Um, once you have your guess, we used another match statement with the combination of compare to take the number and match it on three different criteria, less than the actual number, greater than or equal to. Obviously, if it's less than, we print too small. If it's greater than, we print too big. And if you guess the right number, we print you win. And then we break out of the loop and the program is over. So it exits. So uh, what I'll do here is I'll run the program so we can see what we had. And then we'll go right into chapter three. So we learned last time that to run the program, we use cargo run. So first, I'm going to have to go into projects, guessing game. And now I'll run cargo run. So it's saying, guess the number, please input your guess. Last time we had somebody clever in the chat, I believe it was Archangel25, mentioned we should use binary search to beat this guessing game. It's a pro move. So what we'll do is we'll do something similar. So we'll go 50, too small. So we'll go to 75, too big. Ooh. So we'll do, let's do now, let's see 50, we'll do 63. Too big. All right, so we'll go now between 63 and 50 let's do uh let's do 55 too small let's do 60 too small so it's got to be 61 or 2 let's go with 61 oh too small so 62 we guessed it we got it and now we won and it exited so what happened there was when we guessed too small so first we guessed 50 it's too small so it hit this part of the match printed too small the loop continued right we then got a greater than, printed too big. We then got a too big again, a too small. And then finally we hit this match, which caused us to print you win and also break out of the loop and exit the program because that is the last, the loop is the last line of execution of this program. So that catches us up. That's where we're at. Again, if you missed it and you want to go through the entire session, you could find it here on YouTube at my YouTube channel. Just search Tom McGraw, you'll find it. It's this video right here. All right, so today, let's go. Let's jump in, chapter three. All right, let's do it as a group. Let's see, let's get, get some comments in the chat. We'll get going. We got a good good group here. We got JavaScript, Mick, Clam Watson, Part-Time Lover, Data Dog. Whoa, Data Dog. Observing, I like it. Clever, clever. Data Dog is good for observability. Hey, oh, I like it. Very good. All right, so today what we're gonna do, chapter three, common programming concepts. So what it, the book is going to do is it's going to relate concepts in Rust to concepts that you may know from other languages. So I'm just going to move myself over here while we go through this. So if you're familiar with another programming language, we're going to try to relate what we're learning here to that language. I'm most familiar with JavaScript. I also can do some Python, but I'll probably, you'll hear me mostly relate things to JavaScript, but the book has what you need to relate it to your language of choice. They'll mention some concepts in Java that you may see and so forth. Um, so here it says this chapter covers concepts that appear in almost every programming language and how they work in Rust. Many programming languages have much in common at their core. We know this is true, right? Variables, functions, loops. Uh, none of the concepts presented in this chapter are unique to Rust, but we'll discuss them in the context of Rust and explain the conventions around using these concepts. Awesome. I'm excited. So we're going to learn about variables, basic types, functions, comments, and control flow. Foundations, right? Foundations. So this is about keywords. If anyone's not familiar with keywords, they're basically reserved words in the language. You can see syntax highlighting gives you kind of a hint as to what's a keyword. So let is a keyword, right? Uh, loop is a keyword, match is a keyword. So it's, it's reserved words within the language that we won't be using outside of their actual function. So let's jump in. All right. Ooh, we got a little crab here. We got a little rustation. So I'm excited. If any of you remember from the first part, these rustations will mark bits of code with their status. So the question mark means that this code won't compile. And actually, if you hover, it says this code does not compile. And there's little um, markers using the rustation. There's like the unsafe marker when the code will, will compile, but is unsafe. Uh, happy restation means the code will compile. So let's keep an eye out for those. Those are pretty cool to see along the way. All right. Variables immutability. We touched on this last time a little bit. You have immutable variables. 
that cannot be changed and mutable variables. We leveraged a mutable variable here with our guess variable, right? Because we, we ended up making it mutatable so that we can mutable so we can mutate it. Um, as mentioned in chapter two, variables are by default immutable, meaning they cannot be changed, right? This is one of the many nudges Rust gives you to write your code in a way that takes advantage of safety and easy concurrency that Rust offers. So it's safe because it can make guarantees. We know that this thing is going to be this thing when we try to use it. Uh, but we can make things mutable. Uh, we're going to explore why Rust encourages you to favor immutability over immutability and why sometimes you might want to opt out of that immutability to get something done like what we do with guess, right? Um, so when a variable is immutable, once a value is bound to a name, you can't change that value. Just what we talked about last time. So here, what it's telling us to do is to create a new directory uh, called variables. And we're going to use cargo to generate that out so we can try out some of this code. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to go ahead and move myself to up here. So I'm out of your way a little bit. And I'm going to over here, go ahead and clear this. And what we'll do is we'll back out a guessing game and we'll do cargo new variables. So created a variables and you can see that here. So we will CD into that. We'll just open up the main RS, which is what it's telling us to open up. And we'll type out what we have here. So we're going to get rid of this print hello world and we'll do, let me just change my space again. I should still have to configure that. But for now, there we go. So let x equal five. Then we're going to print x. I like that auto completion. I'm getting that again. If you missed last time, I'm getting that from the Rust extension here. So definitely key to have this thing installed. Philadelphia, I like it. Yeah, definitely key to have this installed. It's going to give you auto suggestions. It's going to give you better syntax highlighting. It, it is a must have if you're using VS Code, in my opinion. Okay, so we're going to print x here i believe yeah so we're going to use a uh, template string the value of x is and again whatever these curly braces wherever you see these curly braces that's where it's going to template in our second argument here x uh, and we're going to mark the end of the line with a semicolon which we learned last time now i'm going to try to mutate x and i haven't marked it as mutable so this is going to cause an issue and i think that's what they want us to see they want us to see what it, it looks like when we mess it up the value of x is Let me clean that up a bit. Okay, so now what it's saying to do is to try to run cargo run so we get this nice error. Oh, let me go into variables first, cargo run. Okay, check out these errors. The, this is one of the reasons people love this language. In, in surveys, this comes up a lot. It's one of the reasons if you follow me on Twitter, you know I'm a fan of Elm. We get great error messages. Look at this, can assign twice to a mutable variable X. It doesn't say, cannot pointer exception undefined of local. No, it's very clear. It says cannot assign twice to mutable variable X. It points to that variable. First assignment to X, make this binding mutable. And it even tells you how to do it, mute X, right? So here they're telling us in there, they're just pointing out the same error that we've seen there and going over it a bit. So you can't assign twice to a variable. That's because it's immutable. It's calling it out. We need to make it mutable if we want to do that. So let's do that. Let's make it mutable, which is what they're telling us to do next. So we'll say mute X. And now if we do cargo run, we'll see it builds. So it compiled and there you go. The value of X is five. That's line three executing. And the value of X is six. That's line five executing. So mutability in this case, it worked. Now, again, you saw they mentioned there's reasons for mutability. They're not just trying to make it inconvenient by default. They're making it safe by default. So we always want to favor immutability where possible. Now, there are times when mutability has its benefits. If you're mutating a very large object in line, it can actually be more efficient than completely copying the immutable version and creating a new one. Uh, this, When you're going to hit that type of bottleneck and actually need to make that performance optimization, it's going to be pretty far along. You have to be mutating rather large objects, maybe some nested properties, nested arrays. And if you do get to that point, then you want to reach for probably mutability. But other than that, immutability, you can just copy the object, modify what you need, and go from there. And so anyone familiar with Redux or something on, in JavaScript where newer frameworks where they're favoring immutability, 
that's why it's more predictable more easy to to track what something is at a given time all right so we got this perfect uh we're allowed to change the value of x binds from five to six when mute is used in some cases you'll want to make a variable mutable because it makes the code more convenient to write right we said that it makes it more convenient there are trade-offs to consider though so bug you know in addition to bug prevention right cases when you're using large data structure uh, mutating instance in place may be faster than copying. So here's what I was just mentioning. Mutating in place may be faster than copying uh, and returning newly allocated instances. With smaller data structures, creating new instances and in writing in a more functional programming style may be easier to think through. So lower performance might be a worthwhile penalty for gaining that benefit. And that's kind of where you've seen some of the JavaScript frameworks lean, right? Or in Python, we, we mutate a lot, but there's libraries that have you avoid that difference between variables and constants so this we had a question last time about this because we're using let but it's immutable so it feels like a constant but there's a key difference and this is that difference so being unable to change the value of a variable might have reminded you of another program concept the constant first you aren't allowed to use mute with constants constants aren't just immutable by default they are always immutable cool to know you declare constants using the const keyword instead of let and the type of the value must be annotated. So you have to put that type annotation. So if you remember here in our main RS, in our guessing game, this is an example of a type annotation. So we have the, the variable name, colon, and then the type. In this case, it's an unsigned 32-bit integer. So that's, that's an example of a type annotation. We don't have many other type annotations in here, and that's because of type inference. The program can infer the type based on the usage of the variable but in a constant saying you have to do it. Um, and the type of value must be annotated. We're about to cover types and type annotations in the next section, data types. Cool. Uh, constant can be declared in any scope, including the global scope. Good to know, so outside the main there, um, or inside the main actually, which makes them useful for values that many parts of the code need to know. So if you wanna share them. So constants that you need to share. One example of this, we do this all the time in other programming languages. Maybe you have the URL of an API you wanna hit. Or maybe you have the number of turns that a player is allowed. Um, something that's not going to change. And I think the next part here is key. Um, constants may be set only to a constant expression, not the result of a function call or any other value that could only be computed at runtime. Now, this is where we differ from something like JavaScript. If you're familiar with JavaScript, and let's go ahead and we'll pull something up here. Let's, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and clear this out. I'm gonna type node to go into my node uh, runtime and REPL. And here, what I can do is I'm gonna show that a constant in node doesn't have to be declared statically, right? It can actually be computed at runtime. So what I mean by that is, let's say we have a function called add. So I'm gonna say const, and I'll make this a constant. Uh, add equals, and it's a function that takes um, x and y, and it'll return x plus y, right? Um, and I can call add, and I can say 5, you know, 4, 3, and we're going to get 7. So that's our function. Now, I can declare a constant and say uh, 7 equals add 4, 3. And now 7 is 4, 3, and that's valid. So that's me actually setting a constant equal to something that needs to be evaluated at runtime. Rust constants, you can't do that. They're not something where you're gonna have it in the code be evaluated at runtime. It's not gonna be the, the return of a function. It's gonna be something static. So we're talking strings, integers defined right there. So something like this. Oh, seven equals nine, yeah, that's great. 7 equals 7, right? So that, that's more of a an example of, oh, const. That's more of an example of how Rust would treat it. And you can see Node has some checks too that make sure it's already declared if you're in strict mode. So that's, that's a big difference. Um, I found it interesting that they put it as like the last difference. I think that's a pretty big difference, right? Than other languages anyway. But a lot of languages that have constants or enums will do this. All right, so we have um here's an example of a constant declaration where constant's name is max points and its value is set to 100,000. rust naming convention for constants is to use all uppercase and underscores between words and underscores can be inserted in numeric literals to improve readability 
that's pretty cool. Uh, that's not something we could do with JavaScript. I don't remember if Python can do that, but that's that's pretty nice. Uh, definitely makes it more readable. They're valid for the entire time a program runs within the scope they are declared in, making them a useful choice for values in the application domain that multiple parts of the program might need to know about, such as maximum number of points uh, any player in a game is allowed to earn or the speed of light. So things that we have constant, they're constant, they're not going to change, they're defined for the life of your program. Maybe, like I said, they're the URL endpoint, they're the string for a URL endpoint, they're the name of a particular domain that you're you're working in, they're a an array of months, which I think they'll use later, but a set thing that's not going to change, right? And not going to be evaluated at runtime. So kind of cool. Okay, here's an interesting concept that we want to touch upon because we actually used it, and it's shadowing. As you saw in guessing game tutorial, in the comparing the guess to the secret number section, you declare a new variable with the same name as a previous variable, and the new variable shadows the previous variable. Uh, Rust stations say that this first variable is shadowed by the second, which means that the second variable's value is what appears when the variable is used. We can shadow any variable by using the same variable's name and repeating the use of the let keyword. So that's important. You need to repeat the use of the let keyword. So here you can see shadowing. It, it, it looks strange, right? But I think it does have its uses. And we, I think the way we used it in our guessing game is probably one of the best cases. So here we see let x equal 5, x equals x plus 1, x equals x plus 2. Uh, let's write this. Let's go ahead and try this out here. So we'll do... And you'll notice that we're not using the mute keyword. So that's that's the difference, right? We're using the same variable name. We're not using the mute keyword to make it mutable. So let x equal 5, x equals x plus 5. And what's what's interesting is you see we are using the previous value of x, which is kind of cool. x. Oh, wait, they did plus 1. We're going to do times 2. And we'll do plus 1. And then we'll print it. value of x is and we get our template string here and we'll save that we'll call cargo run x is 12 x is 5 x plus 1 is 6 x times 6 times 2 is 12 isn't 5 plus 1 times 2 7 oh good question but we are not doing it in a single evaluation so it's going to evaluate line 2 then line three, then line four. Had we done it in a single expression, you would be correct, part-time lover. Um, let's demonstrate that. There you go, there's your seven. Um, so again, the difference is in this case, it's a single expression, which we'll use PEMDAS. <laughs> I don't remember. I remember PEMDAS. We'll use PEMDAS, right? Parentheses exponent, you know what I'm saying? Uh, when we're doing a single line evaluation, but in this case, we're evaluating as two separate lines. So in code, what's gonna happen is the first line will be evaluated. Uh, this will be evaluated, and the value of it will be stored as x, and then we will run line four. So after this point, x would now be equal to six, and at this point, we would have six times two is 12. Awesome question. and. Something maybe we take for granted when we're coding that we know each line is going to execute. But yeah, fantastic question. Thank you for that. Um, so now we see that this is shadowing. Now, a better use case for shadowing or the way that we used it here is when you're changing the type. So for our case, shadowing, we weren't just adding or changing a number. We had guess, and guess was a string because it came from standard input, which we know is going to give a string. We actually initialized it as a new string, and we converted it to, yeah, I like what you're saying there, partner. we converted it from a string to an integer. And so that was a great use of shadowing because we didn't need to change guess. If you're familiar with another programming language, you probably do something like guess string and then guess int. So it cuts that out. And I think they, they mentioned that here. So um, shadowing is different from marking variables mutable because we'll get a compile time error if we accidentally try to reassign to this variable without using the let keyword. Mutable, leave the let keyword out immutable we need to use it if we're going to shadow by using let we can perform a few transformations on a value but have the variable be immutable after those transformations are complete so again it's going to add that extra layer of safety 
Now, I think we want to be careful and make sure we're using it appropriately when we're actually mutating types, but very cool, cool concept and useful. One of the uh, use cases I had thought of for this is, you know, in JavaScript, when we make an asynchronous request or, or you know, Python anywhere, we're making an asynchronous request and you get back uh, the results, but then you want to actually grab the JSON out of that result. So you'd have result, and then you call to JSON on it, await on that. And then you say maybe result JSON or data. Imagine if you could just say data and then data equals, you know, response.json. And from there you can just continue and you can use the same variable name. You're just making transformations along the way. I think that'd be pretty cool. Cause right now I, you can see differences in my code and someone else's code based on what we name those things, even though they're common, common use cases. So I think that's pretty cool. And it, it saved us some some time here with guess. We didn't have to say guess string, guess parsed. So pretty cool. Um, okay, so here you can see they have spaces, um, which is number of spaces, and then they convert spaces to the number of spaces actually entered. So that's pretty cool. So the construct is loud because the first spaces variable is a string type, and the second spaces variable, which is a brand new variable that happens to have the same name as the first one, that's key, is a number type. Shadowing thus spares us from having to come up with different names. It's exactly what we just mentioned, such as spaces string, spaces none. It's pretty cool. If we try to use mute for this, we'll get a compile error. So if I tried to use mute for this here, I would get a compile error. So let's try that. Yeah. And it tells you remove the mute. Variable does not need to be mutable. So pretty cool. Um, again, this is one of the cool things that I've heard and seen now firsthand of why Rust is pretty enjoyable to use. And like many of you may may say the compiler or you know if you if you're thinking the compiler is yelling at you or it's it's cuz you've messed up, it's not. The compiler is there to help you. You will always hit compiler errors and you'll actually lean on it. So it, it's not like a, it's there to to scold you or tell you you've done something wrong. It's something to be to to lean on. It's something to actually leverage to get information off of. Um, so Programmers of any age that have been working with a language for however long, regardless of how long you've been working with the professional, I'm sure the people who write Rust, everybody, you'll always run into compiler errors and you'll you'll use them, you'll leverage them, and that's why they're so useful and worded. So don't don't ever think that because you get a compiler error, you've you've failed in any way. Um, it's part of the tool belt. That's what it's there for. So use it. Lean on that for some help. All right, now that we've explored how variables work, let's look at more data types that we can have. I'm excited. More data types, let's get into it. We've dealt with strings, we've dealt with numbers. Come on, let's learn a, bit, let's learn a little bit more. Every value in Rust is of a certain data type. Let me just scroll here so you can see that. Which tells Rust what kind of data is being specified so it knows how to work with that data. We'll look at two data Type subsets, scalar and compound. Ooh, I'm excited. All right. So keep in mind that Rust is statically typed language. Can you see that? It's a statically typed language, which means it must know the types of the variables at compile time. So it needs to know ahead of time the types of the variables. So not afterward, it needs to know ahead of time. Compile time. The compiler can usually infer the types. So that's what we saw here in our guessing game. We only actually typed this guess here. It inferred the types for the other one. So that's pretty cool. Let me pop myself over here so that you can see what we're dealing with. Okay. So scalar and compound are the two types. It can usually infer the type. In cases when many types are possible, such as when we converted a string to a numeric type using parse. Remember we did that with guessing game. You can see that here. We converted it. We must add type annotations. That's what we just mentioned. So that's why we had the U32. And if we don't, we get an error message. Now there's different types, scalar types. A scalar type represents a single value. Rust has four primary scalar types, integers, floating point numbers, booleans, and characters. If you're familiar with any other languages, you probably dealt, uh, you know, Python, you probably dealt with floats. JavaScript, you dealt with floats. Those are decimals, right? Booleans, true, false represented in binary, right? They're true, false. Uh, regular integers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and so forth. Integer type, an integer is a number without a fractional component, so no decimal, right? 
We use one integer type, we use the unsigned 32-bit integer, but there's also the default, which is the signed 32-bit integer, meaning it can represent negative or positive. Um, so let's actually try that out. So let's do, what I wanna try here is I wanna try creating an unsigned integer and making it negative and see if it complains. So let's do x equals, and we're gonna say it's an unsigned 32-bit integer, and we're gonna set it equal to negative five. Oh, it's already complaining. Look how fantastic this is. But let's just, anyway. Let's just mess with it. So first of all, let's look at this. It's already saying here, cannot apply unary operator negative to type u32. So this is that plugin I mentioned. Pretty awesome. It's telling us right away, without us even having to compile it, this is gonna cause an error. But I do wanna run it just to see what we get. So let's do cargo run. There you go, same thing. So it just, it just literally put this message there. So that's awesome. Now, if I wanna be able to use this, what if I change this to an I? There we go. Now I run cargo run and bam, it works. So we have signed and unsigned integers, pretty cool. Um, table 3.1 shows the built-in integer types in Rust. Each variant in the signed and unsigned column, for example, I16, can be used to declare a type of integer value. So here's the table of different ones. Awesome, so we've used 32-bit unsigned, we now use 32-bit signed, which was is super useful if you wanna go into the negatives. So maybe if you have a, a game that you're counting score and you want your score to be able to go into negatives, maybe you're playing golf, can't go into negatives now. But if you're going to something that you wanna support negatives, that's great. 64-bit, 128-bit, and arc. Each variant can be either signed or unsigned, and it has an explicit size. Signed and unsigned refer to whether it's possible for a number to be negative or positive, as we talked about. Uh, whether the number needs to have a sign with it, or whether it only ever be positive and can therefore be represented without a sign, unsigned, easy. It's like writing numbers on paper. When the sign matters, a number is shown with a plus sign or minus sign. However, when it's safe to assume the number is positive, it's shown with no sign. Sign numbers are stored using two's complement representation. Pretty cool, and there's a link there for two's complement if you don't know what that means. And it shows there's a breakdown for each of these integers. So each sign variant can store numbers from negative two to n minus, negative two to the power n minus one to two to the power n minus one. And it shows you what it equals here, negative 128 to 127. Unsigned variants can store numbers from zero to two to the n minus one. So a u8 can store, an unsigned eight can store numbers from zero to two to the eight minus one, which equals 255. So very detailed here. They're going into a lot of detail, this is cool. And because we're gonna be doing some low level stuff, right? So it's important to know how to handle these in, in a very efficient way and know what we're dealing with. I don't know if we're gonna get into this, but we'll see. Additionally, the I size and unsigned size types depend on the kind of computer your program is running. 64 bits if you're on a 64 bit machine and 32 bits if you're on a 32 bit architecture. You can write integer literals in any form shown in the table below. How do you know which type of integer you use? This is the important part, right? Part-time lover, in the chat, if you need to generate a variable that represents the change in the unemployment rate, that should be unsigned. Well, it should be unsigned if you're doing change, if it's as long as the change can't be negative, right? <laughs> because it can be negative. If it, if it can be negative, it should be signed, right? Negative or positive. So for the unemployment rate, if it's negative, if it can be negative, it should be signed. I like it. Um, integer overflow. So this is interesting. I read this, actually, I've read this before. It's it's a interesting thing. Let's say you have a variable of type u8 that can hold values between 0 and 20, 255. If you try to change the variable to a value outside, like 256, it's going to wrap, right? It's going to create overflow. Um, you're not supposed to use that as a feature. If you want that overflow, there actually is a basically a type you can use called wrapping that will do that for you. But that's getting into the weeds there. Floating point types. Rust also has two primitive types, floating point numbers, which are numbers with decimal points. Uh, Rust floating point types are F32 and F64, which are 32 bits and 64 bits inside, respectively. The default type is F64 because on modern CPUs, it's roughly the same speed as F32, but it's capable of more precision. Pretty cool. Here's an example that shows floating point numbers in action. Let's try this out. So 
let's go ahead and delete this. Let's do let x equal 2.0. And then we'll do let y equal 3.0. And we'll specify, they're actually having a specify for y that it's of type F32. And then we can do, ooh, we can do let z equal x plus y. And then let's see, we'll do print ln. The value of z is, and I don't know if this came up, but it's worth noting. Let me just run this first, clear that out. Let me move my camera here so you can all see this cargo run. It's worth noting, so it's saying the value of z is five, which is correct, but it's worth noting we didn't convert z to a string to actually be able to print it. So println, as I mentioned, is a macro. So the macro behind the scenes is using multiple functions. It's a, it's a composition, composition of multiple functions. And so what it's doing is it's, it's doing that conversion for us. It's a, a, figuring out how to take z and make it so that it can be templated into a string. Um, if any of you have used languages before where you've gotten an issue where it says can't be converted to string or to string of undefined, that would be because the language is trying to convert it to a string. So behind the scenes, println is taking that integer, or in this case, floating point, f32, right? And converting it to a string for us. That's the benefit of using that macro. So pretty cool. Numeric operations. Rust supports the basic mathematical operations you'd expect for all of the number types. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and remainder. Some would call that modulus or modulo, right? The following code shows how you'd use each one in a let statement. So addition, classic, right? Let's zoom in here, actually. I want to make sure we can all see this. Addition is classic. Subtraction, classic. Is Z F32 or F64? That is a fantastic question. I believe type inference would indicate because we specified the type that Z would be of type F32. I don't know if there's a way for us to f identify the type besides if we were to try to specify it here. And if it wasn't an F32, we'd get an error here. But as you can see, when we run it works. So Z is gonna be of type F32. Now, what happens if I say specifically F64? Now you run into that instance. So I didn't specify 64. So uh, in the chat you said, since you combined F64 and F32, I didn't specify. I know that the default, you know, the default may be, did they say what the default was? I don't think they said what the default was. Yeah, okay, so they did, so F64. However, um, because of type inference, when the compiler saw that I was I was adding an F32 to an F64, type inference will take precedence over the default type. So type inference, in this case, what I believe was happening, is type inference said, okay, we can infer that X is of type F32 because you're trying to perform an operation on it. Therefore, Z will be of type F32. And you can see if I specify F64 explicitly, if I specify F64, we're getting an error. So JavaScript MIC, the default type is F64 because on modern CPUs, it's roughly the same speed as 32, but it's capable of more precision. Yes, and that is quoted right here. Very good. And, and so in this case, you can see I specified F64, and now it's saying mismatch type. So the type inference in this case is not going to apply. It's going to think it's 64. It won't let us compare. So when I do this, when I get rid of it, uh, type inference is going to infer it is a 32 type, so F32, and it will treat X as an F32. So great question, part-time lover, fantastic question, and thank you for JavaScript Mick for pointing that out. Very cool. We can see that's a cool example of when type inference can be overriding a default type, right? Depending on how we used it. So we basically told Russ, hey, we're gonna be adding this to an F32 and it inferred, okay, I'm making an F32. I'm not gonna mess around with it. But when we said explicitly it's an F64, yo, and no one's dissing Nintendo 64 here, if that's what it sounds like. But when it's an, when we specified it's an F64, then it said, okay, you have a mismatch type. So very powerful language, very powerful. I like that. Okay. 
Um, if this looks unfamiliar to you, that's okay. This will calculate the remainder. So it'll say divide 43 by five and give us the remainder. That's the modulo uh, parentheses. Very common, common in JavaScript. We see that in other languages, so very good. All right, each expression in these statements uses a mathematical operator and evaluates to a single value which is then bound to a variable. Appendix B contains a list of operators that Rust provides. So hopefully we will dive in. I don't know if we're going to dive into the appendix. Yo, maybe you do that on your own. I don't know. We'll see. Let me pop myself back over here. F64, F64. <laughs> Hell yeah. N64 is great. N64 is great. All right, the Boolean type. This one's, come on. It's easy. True or false. That's it, two values. As in most other programming languages, a Boolean type has two possible values, true and false. Notice the lowercase, right? We're getting out of the Python, capital T, capital F. We're going lowercase t, lowercase f, JavaScript style. Easy peasy. Booleans are one byte in size, right? The Boolean type in Rust is specified using bool. Not Boolean, not lean and rhymes, not boo like a ghost, just bool. Just like this, pretty cool. The main way to use Boolean values is through conditionals, such as an if expression. So we've seen this, other languages use Booleans, if this, then that, you know, if else. So pretty, pretty straightforward there. Character type, so this is interesting, right? Characters, some languages have them, some kind of have them or implement them in a different way, some don't. We're gonna be talking about characters, we're gonna be using single quotes, single character. There is a caveat. Not a caveat. We know that emojis are represented, right? They can be represented as a single character, right? So we'll see that here. So far we've worked with numbers, but Rust supports letters too. Rust car type is the language's most primitive alphabetic type. And the following code shows one way to use it. Note that the car literals are specified with single quotes as opposed to double quotes for a full string, right? Modulo and reminder are not the same. It is different for negative number. That is a great point. Crowsbow, thank you for that. So here we have a bunch of examples of characters. So you have your Z here. You can see, I don't know if you can see this on the screen, but we have a slightly different Z character. And then we have an emoji. And all of them are valid characters in Rust. I lost it. Ugh. Where'd you go, emoji? There it is. Let me zoom in one level and make that a little better. Okay. Uh, Rust car type is four bytes in size and represents a Unicode scalar value, which means it can represent a lot more than just ASCII. That's pretty awesome. Accented letters, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean characters, emoji, and zero with spaces are all valid car values in Rust. Very cool. Very cool. Unicode scalar values range from U plus 0000 to UD7FF and UE000 to U10FFFF, inclusive. Oh. A little bit, right? However, a character isn't really a concept in Unicode, so your human intuition for what a character is may not match, right? May not match what a character is in Rust. And they're going to go into more detail on that in the store UTF-8 encoded strings text with strings chapter eight yo chapter eight we're getting there you know we're, we're, we'll be there we'll be there before you know right now it seems way off we're like chapter eight oh man i don't even know if 2020 the way 2020 is going but we'll get there don't worry hang in compound types compound types can group multiple types yo now we're talking this is the power of types this is what i want to see i want to see compound types maybe some union type action Compound types can group multiple types. Rust has two primitive compound types, tuples, right? And arrays. So tuples, we're gonna see right here. Here's an example of a tuple. If you're not familiar with a tuple, because it's something we don't usually deal with in JavaScript, if you're coming from a JavaScript background, but if you're coming from any other language, you probably use them because they are extremely useful. Um, a tuple is a general way of grouping together a number of values. Generally, you see them in groups of two or groups of three, um, sometimes more, but more commonly than not, you're looking at groups of two or groups of three. An example of a extremely 
useful use case for a tuple is x, y coordinates tuple x, y uh, with height, again, similar to x, y uh, use for, for tuple. So there's, there's tons, tons, obviously, but those are some common use cases you may have come across. Tuples have fixed length. Once declared, they cannot grow or shrink in size. That is key, right? They're fixed. Um, we can create a tuple by writing a comma separated list of values inside parentheses. Each position in the tuple has a type. And the types of the different values in the tuple don't have to be the same. That's awesome, right? So you could have two different types. So you could have name, age, string, unsigned 32 bit integer. Yo, they're not going to be signed. You're not going to negative age. You're not going into the Rosh Al Ghul, Lazarus Pit. So. We're going on sign 32 for that. Uh, we created two by writing comma separate values. We've added additional type annotations in this example. So here, they've added it here for us to see, but again, it would infer it, right? And as we saw before, this would be inferred as an F64. F64 is in the chat for N64. Um, but yeah, so you have our tuple. We have an a signed 32-bit integer, an F64 default float, Right, more precision, and an unsigned 8-bit. Just one. The variable tuple binds the entire tuple because a tuple is considered a single compound element. So this is a, considered a single compound element, or single type here. To get the individual values out of the tuple, we can use destructuring. If you're familiar with JavaScript, uh, we can do a little bit here. Let me just, we can go into Node. We'll do a little destructuring. If you're familiar, it's pulling values out of another object or something. So for example, destructuring JavaScript that you may have used is something like, let's say we have a constant obj equals, and it's got an x one and a y two. The way destructuring works is we can say x comma y equals obj, and now we have x and we have y. So it's pulling out those individual properties. And so that you can see it happening here. So let's try that out. So I'm just gonna go ahead and delete this, delete this, delete this, delete this, delete this. And we'll go ahead and create a new tuple and we'll set it equal to what they have here, 500 comma, 500, 6.4 and one. And, and that in a semicolon and let's do a little destructuring. So we'll grab out X, Y, and Z, which are the first, second, and third from TUP. And we'll go ahead and print the value of X is the value of Y is the value of Z is. So we're gonna go a little bit above and beyond here, but you get the idea. And so here we're using three templates and that's why you provide the three arguments. So hopefully this will work based on what we've learned last time. Um, so I don't need to move my camera for this one. You should be able to see it. Cargo run. And here you can see we have X 500 value of Y is 6.4 and the value of Z is one. So pretty neat. So that's destructuring. So you can see the program first creates a tuple and binds it to the variable tube and then uses the pattern with let to take tube and turn it into three separate variables. And those variables will be of the types that you declared in the tuple. And if you didn't declare them, they will be inferred. In addition to destructuring through pattern matching, we can access a tuple element directly using a period followed by the index of the value. So that's kind of interesting. If you're familiar with JavaScript, you may know that arrays are just objects indexed on a number. So this is similar to that. Pretty cool. Let's go ahead and modify this a bit. So what we'll do is let's just grab X from here. We'll grab X from our destructuring. So we'll say X equals two dot one and we'll grab Y from there to Sorry, we have to do X is zero because they're zero indexed. Tube dot one will be Y and Z will be tube dot two. All right, so now what we should have if I run this, you can see down here, cargo run. There we go, 506.4. So 
Another interesting way to access them, the destructuring was a little nicer for what we need in this case, but this is showing you the options. So pretty, pretty great. All right. The array type, let's go. Let's get started. Let's get started on the arrays. Let's see what this is about. Another way to have a collection of multiple values is with an array. Unlike a tuple, every element of an array must have the same type. This is interesting. This is cool, right? You can you actually don't need to do this in other in some other languages. JavaScript, for example, will let you put a string in an integer, right? So this is cool. It's like a single type. And the benefit of this, there's a lot of benefits, right? We can map over this array and trust that everything is of the same type. And so we can perform operations that would only be performed on a certain type. For example, if you have an array of strings, or maybe it's a something, anything you can call that length on. If it's all of that type and within the map function you're calling that length, you're assuming that everything in that array supports that function. So pretty cool. Um, we're going to have only one type in an array. It's good practice. Even if you don't use a language that's typed, always good practice to make sure an array is of one type. Unless, of course, you're implementing some sort of stack where you have to put multiple things. In Rust, the values going into array are written in comma-separated list. Very similar to every language we've you've probably used. You've definitely seen it written this way, I imagine. If you haven't programmed before and this is your first time, this is how we write out arrays. We use brackets, comma separated. You'll see this a lot. Arrays are useful when we want your data allocated on the stack rather than on the heap. So this is a interesting Rust thing. It lets you make these decisions. So let's go into this a little bit. We will discuss the stack and the heap more in chapter four. Let's go into this a little bit in chapter four. All right, hold on or when you want to ensure you always have a fixed number of elements. So a set number of elements. An array isn't as flexible as flexible as the vector type. A vector is similar to a collection, is a similar collection type provided by the standard library that is allowed to grow and shrink. So if you use JavaScript or Python, arrays can grow or shrink, right? You can push onto them, you can pop off of them. In this, if we want that functionality, we need to use a vector. If we want to keep a fixed size, we're going to use an array. Pretty cool. If you're unsure whether to use an array or a vector, probably use a vector. Good tip. Uh, chapter 8 discusses vectors in more detail. Cool. So we have these in Python vectors, right? An example of when you might want to use an array rather than a vector is in a program that you need that needs to know the names of the months of the year. These are fixed. Unless someone starts going and adding more months, please don't. 2020's got 12 months. Let's get let's cut, let's cut one. Cut a month. Don't add any, please. So we have 12 months, they're fixed. This is a great use case. In my opinion, this is a great use case for a constant because this isn't gonna change, but definitely a great use case for an array. It's fixed, right? Uh, you should write an array's type by using square brackets. You would write an array's type by using square brackets and within the brackets include the type of each element, a semicolon and then the number of elements in the array like so. Pretty cool. So here we have A is a, Sign 32-bit integer and there's five elements. So this is a type this is a type declaration for an array that looks like this. The type declaration for an array that looks like this, well let's let's do it. I'm gonna copy this code because I don't want to type out all the months. Woo! And let's type this. So the type for this would be there's strings, so do we just write string, maybe? And then there's 12, and it should tell us, let's see. Cannot find type string, ah, so we want capital S. And then what is it saying here? Oh, well, there should be, let's see. This says, expected struct string found at string. Try using a conversion method. Well. Instead of that, let's see if we can just specify the right type. What is a string reference? So we'll, we'll figure out what this means. We will. But that was cool. It kind of told us, right? We leaned on it a little bit. We said string. And it's like, no, 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 chill. At string and string are not the same. Yes, that is clear here because this didn't work, right? So it says here, expected struct std string found at string. Yes, 
Crossbow, part-time lover is asking, what is the difference? And I'm sure we will find out, but let's see if anyone knows the answer. So it expected struck, this is from the standard library, standard library string, but found ampersand string. So if I know anything about what's going on with the ampersand, we're talking about a reference. So let's see if our, let's Google it. Rust ampersand str. Ah, <gasps> yes. It refers to the standard library string. The type is one of the two main string types, the other being string. Crossbow, you're correct. Look, there's two, you're right. Unlike its string counterpart, its contents are borrowed. Oh, okay. We're gonna get into this borrowed concept in a little bit. Very, very cool. We're gonna get into this borrowed concept in a little bit. But let's look a little bit here. A basic string declaration of this type, hello world, hello world. Here we have declared a string literal known as a string slice. String literals have a static lifetime, which means the string hello world is guaranteed to be valid for the duration of the entire program. We explicitly specify hello world's lifetime as well. Whoa, I, I feel like we're gonna get into this a bit more. I kind of am tempted to look at the other string type, but I'm gonna wait until we get there. But good thing to call out. And look, we just figured it out because we tried to type it and it told us, it told us, how cool is that? The compiler told us, so very awesome. Um, so that's that's pretty awesome, but yes, anyway, that was to illustrate how a type annotation works. We're specifying the length and the string. And again, we can specify the length because it's not gonna change. It's not a vector, it's not gonna grow or shrink. Here, uh, sign 32 is the type of each element. After the semicolon, the number five indicates the array contains five elements. Writing arrays typed this way looks similar to an alternative syntax for initializing array. Let's go. If you want to create an array that contains the same value for each element, maybe you want to just have a set list of things, the same element, you can specify the initial value followed by a semicolon. So we could ditch this. And we could do let a, that, uh, let's just call it let bunch of threes equal, and we'll do three. We're gonna have a bunch of threes, and we'll have 10 threes, well, 12 threes. And so what I'll do here is I'll see if I can print it. Let's see if the macro will allow us to print this. The value of bunch of threes is a bunch of threes. Oh, so look, it's gonna, be not happy with that. So it doesn't implement, interesting. So now we know that println expects this thing to implement display and bunch of trees does not. Very cool, so we'll have to loop through it to print it. That's pretty awesome. And so we will learn how to do that in a second. So pretty cool, that'll give us this. That's what we would have gotten, but we would have gotten 12 of them. Now we could loop over each of them using a for loop or a you know iterator, but we haven't gotten into that in the book. I've seen it before, that's how I know, but we'll get into that. Accessing array elements. An array is a single chunk of memory allocated on the stack. Stack and heap are the two things we're gonna hear a little bit more about. You can access elements of an array using indexing like this. So very similar to JavaScript, very similar to Python, right? Zero indexed, accessing like that. In this example, example, the variable name first will get the value one because that is the value at index zero and second will get the value two, which is at index one. Easy. Now, what happens when you try to request something that is not in bounds? There's five things here. They try to request 10, right? They say, give me index 10. Well, let's do it and let's see. They're, they're giving us a spoiler, you know, but and then you can see this, it's Merit, we said look out for the rest station. This rest station here is indicating that it panics. So it's gonna cause an issue. So let's go ahead and just code this up here. We'll copy this out. We have A, we're gonna grab index 10 and look, it's already telling us, we don't even need to run it. The operation will panic at runtime. How awesome is this plugin? I'm telling you, if you're going without it, it's like the sword in Zelda, right? Don't go at it alone. Get this, get this thing here, it's gonna help you. This operation will panic at runtime. Index out of bounds. The len five, so the length of this thing is five. There's five things in it. 
right? The max index you can go to is four, zero, zero, one, two, three, four. But the index is 10, it's not there. So it's it, it can't get it, right? So it's gonna panic, pretty cool. Will it compile? Yes, I think so. Let's say cargo check, I believe it was, right? So it did, but when you try to run it, it panics. So the difference between compiling and panicking, right? And this thing is super useful because it tells us, highlights it right there. The compilation didn't produce any errors, but the program resulted in a runtime error and didn't exit successfully. That's a panic. When you attempt to access an element using indexing, Rust will check that the index you specified is less than the array length. If the index is greater than or equal to the array, Rust will panic. You saw a panic before we added the check for parsing an integer in our guessing game when we would type a string. It didn't know what to do, it panicked. So that's an example of another example of a panic. This is the first example of Rust safety principles in action. In many low-level languages, this kind of check is not done. Very true. I've seen a many a runtime exception in JavaScript that was due to trying to access blank of undefined or trying to access an array out of bounds. Uh, Rust protects you against this kind of error by immediately exiting instead of allowing the memory access and continuing, which will give you like undefined, it'll throw errors, right? You end up in wonky situations. Chapter nine discusses more of Rust's error handling. We'll get there. All right, everyone still with me? I hope so. A little less coding this time, I feel you, I know, but we're getting into the concepts that are gonna give us the solid foundation to be able to write Rust confidently and to know some of the stuff that Crosbo knows already in the chat. So we're getting there. Functions, we're here, baby. Let's go. This is what we wanna learn, functions. Everyone wants to use functions, we're doing functional programming, right? We're going to be using functions. We're going to be passing functions, first class citizens, passing functions and arguments, right? Higher order functions. Let's get in it. Functions are pervasive in Rust code. You've already seen one of the most important functions in the language, the main function, right? You've seen this in Python, not so much in JavaScript. Python, you've definitely seen this. It's the entry point, right? So it's the entry point of all the programs. And we've also seen the function keyword clearly. Rust code uses snake case, that's with the underscore, similar to what you see in Python, you've seen it in Elixir, you've probably seen it in Ruby. You did not see it in JavaScript because JavaScript we use camel case. Um, so here's our function main, where we have println, and here's another function down here, uh, which is printing another function. So let's go ahead and write this out. I'm gonna type it because I want experience actually doing this, right, I don't wanna just copy it. So we're gonna print ln, hello, Twitch, and here we'll do another function. First, let's write out the function before we call it. I had to leave, but we'll check out the YouTube. Great stream from Legendary. Thank you so much, Datadog. I appreciate your observation of the stream. Another function, print ln, another function, and here we're gonna call another function. And some of you may say, well, you're calling another function, but it's declared below. Whoa, relax, don't worry. Russ is gonna let this happen, we'll see. So here I'm gonna go down, I'm gonna clear this out, and I'm gonna do cargo run. Bam, it worked. So it's gonna go, we're gonna find out why that, that was acceptable. They start with fn, we know that. We can call any function we define by entering its name followed by a set of parentheses. This is just like function invocation you would see in Python, you would see in JavaScript, you would see in many functions, right? Many programming languages. Because another function is defined in the program, it can be called from inside the main function. Note that we define another function after the main function, right? So we're talking about it was defined after. We could have defined it before as well. Rust doesn't care where you define your functions, only that they're defined somewhere. And this is because it's a com it's compiled, right? So it will know all the things that exist. It's not like something like JavaScript that's parsed at runtime where you have to deal with hoisting and making sure things are written in the right order. Very interesting. Let's start a new binary product named functions. Ooh. To explore functions further. Place the another function example in source main and run it. You should see the volume. So we nah, we wrote that already. But here, you know what I'll do? I will go back to what we had here in variables. I'll leave that. Change that to that. 
and I will create a new project call functions. And I'll do cargo new functions. And we'll open up functions slash main. And we'll copy this code because we already wrote it. No use writing it a second time. Save it and we will run it. Cargo, let me move my camera here. Cargo run. And there you see, uh, hello world and another function. Pretty cool. All right. So we started it, we saw that the lines execute in the order in which they appear in the main function, first hello world, then the message from another function. Function parameters, arguments, parameters, arguments. We're going to use them interchangeably. Functions can also be defined to have parameters, which are special variables that are part of the function signature. When a function has parameters, you can provide it with concrete values for those parameters. Technically, the concrete value is called arguments. We use it interchangeably. Uh, the following rewritten version of another function shows that parameters look like in Rust. So we can see here passing a value to um, this is another function. And so we're going to let's do that. Let's pass. And now let's you see, I didn't write the argument yet. So it's going to complain right away. It's going to say the function takes zero arguments, but one argument was supplied again. Beautiful. This is great, right? It's because of this tooling that we get from Rust. Uh, so I'm going to say X and we're going to specify the type. We're going to use U32, unsigned 32 bit. And then we're going to say here, the value of X is template string X. And so now if I run cargo run, well, you should be able to see it here without me moving cargo run. You can see here the value of X is 117. So we, you know, pass an argument. If you've used TypeScript, you may be saying, wow, this looks very familiar. I mean, besides the U32 portion of it, this looks familiar. Um, but this is, and if you haven't, that's okay. All we're dealing with here is this is the argument. So without the type, it would look like this, right? This is just adding the type signature, the colon and the type. So not much different than what you've done passing arguments to functions already, okay? When five is passed another function, the print macro puts five in place of the curly braces. We've been doing this over and over, nothing new here. In function signatures, you must declare the type of each parameter. So this is unique, right? We have to act, we have to say the type that it is. This is a deliberate decision in Rust design. Requiring type annotations and function definitions means the compiler almost never needs to use them elsewhere in the code to figure out what you mean. So it gives it, a, it tells the compiler, listen, this function is going to get types of, it's going to get arguments of this type. So the function doesn't need to do inference within there. It knows I'm guaranteed to be getting things of this type. Of course, the program will infer that when that function is called, it is called with the correct types. So you're getting benefits on both sides there. So pretty cool. When you want a function to have multiple parameters, separate the parameters with commas. So very similar to something you've seen, right? Nothing new here um, if you if you use programming language. If you haven't, um, it's pretty straightforward. We're just going to add a comma and the second argument and here you can say, you know, it's expecting two arguments. We're only calling with one. So we will call it with a little halo reference there. I don't know if any of you caught it. No big deal if you didn't. Um, and then here we'll, we'll append a, a second curly brace, which means the second argument will be templated. And so we'll say the value of X is that the value of Y is and you know what we'll do? We'll try to add, let's add a little new line here. I don't know if this will work in Rust. We'll find out. No, apparently. Oh, so this is cool. It's complaining because it's saying two positional arguments in string, but only one was provided. So once we provide it with the Y, that will go away. And let's also put our new line here. So can you do default values in the function or is that the mysterious chapter eight? Great question. So in a lot of programming language, you can have default values such as JavaScript, you can say equals this. Let's try it. Let's see if we can do it. Um, let's test this first, and then we'll give it a shot. I think it's fun to just mess around, give it a shot. So let's do cargo run. So there we go. The value of X is 117. The value of Y is 343. Let's see. Let's see if you can do it. I'm wondering if it's going to go here like this. 
No, doesn't like that. It doesn't like that style. Maybe we could do, hmm. Let's see, let's Google it. Let's jump ahead, let's jump ahead. I think it'll be fun, let's find out. Uh, Rust default arguments. No, bam. Sorry, Rust doesn't support default function arguments. You have to define different methods with different names. There's no function overloading either because Rust used function names to derive types. Okay, let's unpack that a bit. It's a bummer, but I think you will see that there is some other benefits. But yeah, if you need them, if you did like that, yes, it doesn't have it. But you can see here you have to define different methods with different names. There is no function overloading either because Rust used function names to derive types. Now, one of the things you're going to see is we have matching, which will match on different types, right? So I think there will be other benefits that where we will find less use in uh, default arguments. For example, there are other languages I've used where pattern matching is the thing. So you could declare a function with a very specific value. And if that value is passed, then that function will execute. We can try that here and see if that works. So what that would look like is, check this out. Let's see if this works. It's definitely not. Didn't think so. Oh. No, that's not gonna work. So sometimes you can actually, instead of declaring a default variable, you can be very explicit and say that it is going to be this thing. And that's useful for pattern matching. But I think we'll get more into it and see what where we go with that. I'm sure there's a, a design decision. And from what I've seen so far with Rust and what we've all seen here while we're doing it is it tends to, the design decisions tend to err on the side of safety, which makes sense. But we'll see. We'll see why that decision was made. Maybe in the elusive chapter eight, as you mentioned. All right, so we have multiple functions. Very straightforward, pretty easy. Because we called the function of five as the value for x, blah, blah. So they did the same thing here. Very good, very good. Function bodies contain statements and expressions. Function bodies are made up of a series of statements, optionally ending in an expression. So far, we've only covered functions with an ending expression, but you have seen an expression as part of a statement. Because Rust is an expression-based language, what up, Doze boy? Welcome to the chat. Happy to have you. So, so far we've only covered functions with out and ending expression, but you have seen an expression as part of a statement. Because Rust is an expression-based language, this is an important distinction to understand. Other languages don't have the same distinctions. So let's look at what statements and expressions are and how their differences affect the bodies of functions. So pretty cool. Let's see. We've actually already used statements and expressions. Let's go. Statements are instructions that perform some action and do not return a value. We've seen this, right? We've seen this where they perform an action, don't return a value. What, name one, print. It doesn't return anything. It's just printing. It's performing, right? Statements are instructions that perform some action, don't return a value. Expressions evaluate to a resulting value. And we've definitely used those, right? So that's how we've gotten back here, right? These return a value, and that's what we're putting on A. This returns a value, and that's what we're putting on index. Uh, so we can see here, this is a statement. It's just plain and simple, stated, right? Just stated. A main function declaration containing one statement, one statement, that's it, said and done. Function definitions are also statements. So the entire function definition itself is a statement. The entire uh, preceding example is a statement in itself. Very cool. So this is a statement right here. Pretty cool. Statements do not return values. So this whole thing does not return a value. So you couldn't say, for example, and they're doing it here, couldn't say let my index equal let index, right? Because this does not return anything. And in fact, it tells you right here, it's going to say, yo, let expressions in this position are experimental. Whoa. That kind of leads me to believe that maybe at some point 
Oh, they might add it. I don't know. But look at this. This is the important part. Expected an expression, but found a statement. Statements are done. Expressions return something. So this does not return something. The one does, and that's why this works. And you see the example here of uh, a statement. It's saying this is a statement, not nah, chill, can't, can't do it. So pretty cool. We get the error. We saw that error. We didn't need to run it. We saw it right in our, our VS code here, so that was great. Let y equals 6 statement does not return a value, so there isn't anything for x to bind to. Right, so we can't, it's not going to bind to anything. It doesn't return anything. This is a difference from what happens in other languages, such as C and Ruby, where the assignment returns the value of the assignment. So you've probably seen this in JavaScript where you have, like here, x equals y equals 6. Uh, that's not going to fly here, right? Not the case in Rust. Expressions of value to something and can make up most of the rest of the code that you'll write in Rust. Consider a simple math operation such as 5 plus 6, which is an expression that evaluates to 11. Expressions can be part of statements, like the listing in 6, right here, 3, 1. The 6 in the statement is an expression that evaluates to the value 6, which then gets set onto y. Calling a function is an expression. Calling a macro is an expression. Uh, the block that we use to create new scopes is an expression, for example. That's pretty cool. So here, statement, right? Statement, expression return something right it actually returns something so here you notice they didn't say let y equals let x equal y they're actually wrapping it in these scoping parentheses which create an expression so let's do that let's try that out so let's save our variables let's go back to our functions here Whoop. i'm going to create another function called uh expression example and we'll do let x equal 5 just like they have there and we'll say let y equal and we're creating a, an expression block here let x equal 3 and x plus 1 so this is an expression and now there's something unique happening here which they're going to touch upon right here notice no, there's no semicolon after x plus one. And it's not because I left it out on purpose. I mean, I did leave it out on purpose, not because I made a mistake. Would you consider this the Rust equivalent of a lambda? No. I believe we'll get into lambdas in a bit. Lambdas are generally functions, right? This is an expression, um, so not a lambda. A lambda would actually be a function that takes arguments and returns a value. I believe we'll use lambdas more when we actually call, um, when we map reduce over things. But yeah, this is more of an expression, meaning it gets evaluated and the result of the evaluation is returned and can then be assigned. So if I set let y equal to let x equal 3, it wouldn't work because let x equal 3 does not evaluate and, and return something. 3 does, and it puts it into x. But what we're doing here with this block block scoping here, if you're familiar with other languages where you're creating blocks with the curly braces, it's basically saying this whole thing is an expression. And here's the cool caveat. Expressions do not include ending semicolons. If you add a semicolon at the end of an expression, you turn it into a statement, which will not return a value. So this is pretty crazy. Think about this, like we have languages like JavaScript where we just leave off semicolons, we let our tooling put them in. Here, the semicolons really do have a, a meaning. And if we put it on, it means something different than if we leave it off. In the chat, we have Crosbo saying, in Rust, closures are like Lambda. So good to know, awesome. So closure, be like a function, then it closes some value. And we'll, I think we get into that pretty soon. So coming up. But so I want to check out the difference here. So let's let's look at this. So let y is going to be equal to the evaluation of this expression, right? Whatever this expression returns. So let's think, what is it going to return, right? x equals 3, x plus 1 is going to be 4. Now, notice there's no explicit return here, but the fact that we left off a semicolon 
means it's going to be evaluated as an expression and it's going to return a value. So y should then equal four. So we're going to go ahead and print that. We're going to say println the value of y is y. And we're going to, if you notice it's saying, hey, you haven't called this thing. Well, we're going to call it. First, we're going to comment out this and comment out this, and then we're going to call expression example. And we're going to do cargo run. And it's telling you, hey, you never called these. It's giving you a warning because if you're not going to use it, ditch it, right? But here you can see the value of y is 4. Now, I'm going to add that semicolon. Also, let me move myself over here to get out of your way. I added a semicolon here. And now you're going to see that y is not going to have value. And in fact, it tells you right here. Nothing, right? It's like, eh, it doesn't implement display because it's not, it's nothing yet. It's just let y, it has no value yet. And that's because this is going to return a value. Now, as soon as I get rid of that semicolon, you're going to see it's okay with it because it now knows that it's going to be this expression, right? So pretty cool. Um, it evaluates to four, the value gets bound to y as part of the let statement. Note that x plus one without the semicolon. So we just talked about that. Functions with return values. Woo. Here we go. Functions can return values to the code that calls them. We don't name return values, but we do declare their type after an arrow. So this is a functions type definition. So if it returns something, you give it an arrow. In this case, none of our functions were returning anything, right? They were just printing, not returning. Um, in Rust, the return value of function is synonymous with the value of the final expression in the block of the body of the function. You can return early from a function by using the return keyword and specifying a value, but most functions return the last expression implicitly. Here's an example. So implicit return, um, if any of you are familiar with languages like JavaScript or Python, you're going to say return and then the value. If you use other languages, such as Elixir or Elm, there's a notion of implicit return, which is that the last expression in a function body will be returned. So you don't have to say return. And we actually can achieve this in JavaScript with single line functions. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go ahead and pull up Node again, because I like using this as an example, because uh, it's just a language I think a few people are familiar with, and we can try it in Python as well. Um, but I'm going to create a function called add again. I'm going to create the same thing, add equals. Um, and we're going to create a standard, just a regular function like this. Oh, let me go back, actually. So let's do const add equals x comma y. And we're going to do return x plus y. All right. And then I'm going to call add 4 and 3. We'll get 7. Now. I'm going to declare the same function, um, but I'm not going to put the return. I'm just going to say x plus y. Uh, and I'm going to change the name of it to, let's do um, const adder, just to give it a separate name. Um, and we'll do x plus y. And now I'll call adder four three. And it's not returning anything because we left off that return. Now, the exception in JavaScript is if we make it a single line, if we get rid of those curly braces, uh, then it will have an implicit return. So const adder implicit return, let's call it equals x comma y. And I'm just going to return x plus y. So now I'm not using the return. I do not have curly braces. braces. It's a single line. Uh, you could also make it multi-line. You just need to wrap it in parentheses. But now we get the benefit of implicit return. Turn 4,3. There we go. Uh, whereas it looks like in Rust, implicit return is built in. So you will get implicit return from all of your function bodies. And so that's what's happening here. I didn't. We didn't need to say 5. It just was the last thing. So it returned 5. So let me switch myself over here. All right. So let's go ahead and try this something out clear that out. So let's actually return y here. And the way we're going to do that is we're not going to even set it equal to y. We're just going to leave it at that. And I'm going to take out this print and I'm going to move it up here 
and I'm going to set this equal to y. And then I'm going to print the value of y. And so let's see, what is this saying? This is saying y doesn't implement standard display. So this for whatever, oh, because we have to specify what this is going to return, right? So this is now going to return, and uh, we'll do an unsigned 32. And so here it says, u32 found this, implicitly returns as its body, has no tail or return expression. So that's because of the semicolon. If you remember, if we include the semicolon, it has, it's not, it's going to evaluate as a statement, not an expression. So by removing that semicolon, now it's going to actually return this whole thing. So interesting use of semicolons. This is something I'm not familiar with in most languages. Generally, a semicolon is just a decision whether or not you want to put it there. So pretty cool. So let's run this and see if this actually works and actually prints out Y. So pretty cool. Uh, so we're going to do cargo run. Y is four. So pretty awesome. And again, it complained because we weren't using these. We can just put these back in if you'd like, just so we don't get those warnings. Let's clear that out and let's run cargo run again. Uh, we still get the warning help. If this is intentional, prefix it with an underscore. Ah, it's saying we're not using X and prefixing with underscore will get rid of that warning. We're, we don't, we're not using it anymore. So let, we can just toss it. Um, you don't need the curly braces in this case because this is the only expression here. So if we just get rid of this, we'll see that we have our implicit return here, x plus 1. Again, if I put this here, it's not going to return it. If I, put, if I leave it off, it's going to have an implicit return. Now I run cargo run, and life is good. x is 4. If you have any questions about that, we went over it quickly, but pop in the chat. But to sum it up, if you leave off the semicolon, you can use an implicit return. It will return the last thing. It will evaluate as an expression. If you put the semicolon on there at the last line, it will not return it, right? It won't have that implicit return. It'll evaluate as a statement. And we'll get the nice error. Look at this. You put this there, and look, it's like, bam, we expected a 32 bit integer, but you didn't return anything. Yo, you forgot about it. But we take that semicolon off, and it's like, damn, you want that implicit return? You get unsigned 32 bit? Let's go. Pretty cool. I think it's pretty sweet. Definitely something, if I was reading code, I would not pick up on that if I didn't read, if we didn't read this book and go through this together, I don't think I'd pick up on that just reading the code. Somebody would have to explain it to me because that's not something I would look for in a, in a language, not something I'm, I've seen very often. Maybe you have um, in the chat. I don't know. If you have, let me know. I think that's pretty cool. Seems, seems new to me. All right. So pretty interesting. There's a, an example there. There are no function calls, macros, or even let statements in the five function. Again, here we have implicit return, semicolons left off. The five in five is the function's return value, which is why the return type is signed 32-bit integer. Let's examine this in more detail. So they're going to dive in a little bit. There are two important bits. First, the line x equals five shows that we're using the return value of the function to initialize a variable. So they're calling five that function implicitly returns the number five and they're set it equal to x, just like what we did here with y. We're calling the function, storing the value. Because the function five returns five, that line is the same as this. Just like our line is the same as when we uh, made this equivalent to just the block scope, right? So if you look here, it's almost like this function just implicitly returns this. It's kind of interesting. The five function has no parameters and defines the type of the return value, but the body of the function is a lonely five with no semicolon because it's an expression whose value we want to return. If it had a semicolon, it'd be a statement. Very cool. Another example, x equals plus one five, where they're actually passing a value and implicitly returning it. Let's do that. Let's try that out. Let's call this function add three. What do you think add three is going to do? It's going to take X. X is going to be a, let's do unsigned. An unsigned 32 bit integer. It's going to return an I 32. And what is it going to do? It's going to take X and it's going to do X plus three. And we're not adding a semicolon because it's going to return it again. If I add a semicolon, it's going to say, yo, 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 you're not returning anything. Let the semicolon on there. 
I wish it would actually tell you that, but it's, it, it is telling you, hey, you're returning nothing. Um, its body has no tail or return expression. So we could say, and now it's done complaining. I could just put return, but we're gonna go with that implicit return. We're gonna leave off that semicolon and let's try calling add three and see what, see what goes on here. So the value of X is any rust lords in the chat. Yeah, but cow, let's get some rust lords in the chat. Let's go. I'm gonna, I wish we can get that emoji, man. I'll get the rustation emoji. We'll get that going. So we have Y is equal to four at this point. Uh, let's add three. So let's call this let Y plus three equal add three. We're gonna pass it. Look at that. Look at that auto completion. Let's go back there. Let's, let's, let's go back there. Let's look at that auto completion. Add three. It's telling you right here, you gotta pass it a value. It's gotta be a signed 32-bit integer. Let's pass it. Since we use sign, let's play with it a little bit. Let's do, let's set y equal to something else really quick. Let's set y equal to negative five, right? And now let's add three to y. So we should get negative two, right? Because we're dealing with signed integers. Pop a semicolon on there. And let's go ahead and print that. So we'll say print the value of y plus three is y plus three. So let me go ahead and pop myself over here. So I'm out of your way, clear this up. Let me zoom in on that a little bit just so you can see it. And we'll do cargo run. And again, this warning's there because we're just not using it, but there you go. Yeah, the value of y is five, the value of y plus three is negative two. So that's it, we're using a signed integer there. Pretty cool. Those with a public static void made print. Oh man, writing Java. Ah. Yeah, it's been a while since I wrote Java. I respect it, I respect the memorization. Function with, so Crossbow in here is saying, function without return or expression implicitly return, which is in Rust union type. And compilers say that th that's this thing, the just the empty brackets that he's mentioning there. And your expected return type are not the same. Awesome. That So what you're saying here is this, unit type very cool so that's this the empty we noticed that here good call at crossbow thank you for that that's awesome so you mentioning this let's see if my error is here somewhere we had it a second ago but that um oh here i'll do it you know what i'll do i'll get it to show up again so crossbow is talking about this here where it's talking about the unit type here that yeah i'll do it with my hands the brackets very cool Whoa, inappropriate. Um, but yeah, so pretty cool. Let me go ahead and get that back there so we have our implicit return. All right, so we have an example here of implicit return with plus one. Writing this code print the value of x is six. So similar to what we did here, we had the plus one function, they're passing it five, getting an implicit return of five plus one, and they're printing it, so pretty cool. Here we have some code that does not compile. And that's because it has the semicolon. So you're not gonna get that implicit return, right? You're gonna get the unit type, which Crossbow kindly mentioned, and you'll get the error right here. So pretty cool, um, pretty awesome. The main error message mismatch type reveals the core issue with this code. The definition of the function plus one says that it will return an assigned 32-bit integer. Uh, let me move over here so you can actually see that. So we're looking right here. It should return a signed 32-bit integer, but statements don't evaluate to value, which is expressed by these brackets, an empty tuple. Therefore, nothing is returned, which contradicts the function definition and results in an error. In this output, Rust provides a message to possibly help rectify the issue. It suggests removing the semicolon, which would fix the error. So, th so it actually does suggest removing the semicolon, which is really cool. That's awesome. So I like that. I mean, damn, it's pretty cool. We're learning a lot today. I am at least, I hope you all are. It's pretty sweet. Comments. I think we can kind of skip through most of this. Comments in Rust are like comments in JavaScript. You're gonna lead them with two slashes. The idiomatic comment style starts with two slashes and the comment continues until the end of the line. Multi-lines look like this. They can also be placed at the end of the line. Good to know. But you're more often gonna see them in this format above the line that's annotating. Wow, that's a big one. 
comments. No. But yeah, if you're not familiar with a language of commenting, it's important, right? This code's not going into your end compiled code. It's just for the reader of the code. So we skim this chapter, but realistically, this is like one of the most important things, right? Like we could say to the next person who's following us or to myself next week when I forget the reason we are leaving off a semicolon is so that this code will implicitly return. So there you go, that's the benefit of comments. Um, one tip, if you're ever working at a place, you're doing PRs, and someone asks you a question in PR about what some of your code does, that's a key or a tip note you should take to put a comment in the code explaining what it does. Because if someone has to ask, generally, it means it's a good place to put a comment. So comments are undervalued. Definitely use them. Every language usually has them. I hope, I hope all of them have it. I don't know of any that don't. If you do, you have them in the chat, but use them. They're fantastic. We spend more time reading code than writing code, right? And we spend more time running code than reading code. Code gets run, right, a lot. Control flow, this is the this is the stuff, right? This is gonna be if statements, loops, right? This is what this is programs. If we wanna write addition and subtraction, look, you bust out your phone, you bust out a calculator, you could do that. Control flow is when we're gonna actually write programs. It's when we're gonna actually make some logic, some algorithms, right? Deciding whether or not to run some code depending on a condition. So we saw a match statement. Now we're gonna see some different flavors. We're gonna see some if statements. So an if expression allows you to branch your code depending on conditions, just like the match, but it's not gonna match on a type, right? It's gonna just be an if else, similar to what we've seen in JavaScript. In fact, this looks exactly like JavaScript, right? Um, so let's see if we can write a conditional. Uh, so we're gonna create a new function here. We're gonna call it greater than number. And we're gonna take in a number that's gonna be an assigned 32-bit integer, which I believe is the default, so we'll leave that off and it's gonna return a bool. So we're, we're gonna go off book here a little bit. And remember, bool is the Boolean type. It's saying, you know, we haven't returned anything yet. We'll get there. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take x and we're gonna say if x is, sorry, we're gonna take another number, greater than number. So given a number, we're gonna pair another number. So greater than number. So we'll take X as number and we'll take a second number. Or why don't we do this? Why don't we do greater than number? Let's just do, let's start basic. Let's do greater than five. And we'll take an X for now just to simulate this. And we'll say if X is greater than five, we'll return true. All right, let's see. True. We don't need to return, we can implicit return. Else, false, right? And so here we have a thing here, type error, we're gonna say it should be of type I32. So it's asking us to specify the type, so we're gonna specify a signed 32-bit integer. All right, so now let's see. What we'll do here is we'll call greater than five and we'll pass it uh, y plus three. Let's just print ln greater than five and we'll pass it y plus three. And we should get false, right? And so you can see here, well, first let's create a string template is y plus three greater than five, question mark. Answer is gonna be that. So we're templating in the result of this, which is gonna be a signed 32-bit integer to here. And let's go ahead and run it. So I'm gonna pop myself over here. And let's run cargo run. Is y plus three greater than five? Answer false. So awesome, it's pretty cool. We did a little conditional there. 
you've probably seen that, right? If you've used other languages, you would be familiar with something like that. Nothing too crazy new, um, but yeah, pretty interesting. All right, so you've seen if statements followed by a condition. So we have our condition there. We've also seen match. And we saw how matches work with arms. And again, the match we can find here, I'll put up guessing game main. And this was a match where we were matching in this case on a type. Um, and then here as well, matching on an ordering. So we've seen matching, matching uses pattern matching there. And now we've seen if statements similar to other languages. Optionally, we can also include an else expression, which we chose to do here uh, to give the program an alternate block of code to execute should the first line not evaluate. So if it evaluates to false, it would execute the second line. So similar to any if box you'd see. Um, so here they're just testing it. And then here you have some code that won't compile. Let number equals three. If number print number was three, it's not letting you do this. Um, you can do this in JavaScript, right? Um, you can do this in Python. We have the notion of truthy and falsy. Rust won't let you do this. You can't just say if number, and if it's truthy, if it exists, um, it will work. You have to explicitly have a check in an if statement return a Boolean. So you can't just say if something's not undefined or, or leverage that truthy or falsy value like you would see in JavaScript, for example. If you wanna check that an object exists before you perform something, you can say if my object, then you know whatever. Can't do that here, it has to evaluate to a Boolean. Um, so this is more of a type safety thing. The if condition evaluates to a three in this time and Rust throws an error because it expects a Boolean. So you may have seen that it should be similar to something, you know, in other languages you may have, again, come across, but we do leverage the benefit that you can do that in JavaScript quite a bit. Um, so kind of just interesting. All right. So let's see. The error indicates that Rust wants a bool. If we want the if block to run only when a number is not equal to zero, for example, we can change the if expression like the following. So this is an if statement, a classic if statement is not equal to zero, run this. Um, we can also do else if. So this is again, something similar to we'd see in JavaScript with else if. In Python, you have elif um, and so forth. So nothing too crazy new here. Uh, we can try something out and we can maybe add more branches here. We could say, you know, if it's greater than five, return true, else return false. Uh, we can do a check if it's equal to five, you know, so using else if. So nothing too new here. I don't think we'll type this out because it's pretty straightforward. Uh, four possible paths, right? If it's divisible by four, because there's no remainder, give us a zero. If it's divisible by three, because there's no remainder, print this. If it's divisible by two, print this. Otherwise, print that it's not divisible by any of those numbers. So classic else if statement. Checks the if statement, it's gonna evaluate each one. If the first one doesn't evaluate, it's gonna to jump to the second one. It's not gonna run the code unless that statement is true, right? So similar to other languages. Number is divisible by two, nor do we see numbers divisible by. So it's just walking us through that. Using too many else if expressions can clutter your code. So if you have more than one, you might want to refactor your code. Chapter six describes a powerful Rust branching construct called match, which we've used before for these cases. So let's try, what do you think? Let's try that. Do you notice that if it is an expression, not a statement? Do you notice that if it is an expression, not a statement? So here, there's no semicolon, right? So it's an expression. So it's gonna return a Boolean. Good point, Crosby, that's a great call out. So it's not like we are putting a statement there because the statement will return anything. We're putting an expression. So there's no semicolon, it's gonna actually evaluate. So great call out. All right, so let's try it out. Let's try, let's try switching to this to a match statement. I think that'd be a fun exercise. So let's copy this function here um, and we'll call it Let's just call it divisible by, divisible by. Um, we're gonna take a number. I think it'd be more interesting. And we'll say number is a unsigned 32-bit integer for now. 
and we'll return, it's not returning anything because we're just printing. Um, and instead of using if statement, let's try using a match statement. And so again, if you are not familiar, oh, let's comment this out for now. If you're not familiar, the match statement we used in the first time, we used it here. And so it's a match on some, in this case, this is a going to return a comparison, but we're going to just match on the expression, like the number itself, right? We're going to match on the number. So let's try that. So let's say match number. And for a match, as you see here, we provide it with multiple expressions and what we should do if the expression returns true. So we'll do, we'll just copy this here. Go ahead and steal these here. And we'll try to get it to work with the match. We'll try to format it and see what, what happens. And so for the match, I'm not sure what we do in any other, like I'm not sure what the equivalent of an else would be, but let's try doing these two first and see what happens. So what is this saying? So this is saying expected one of at if or found modulo. So we probably have to maybe wrap it in this. Whoa, my mistake. No, it doesn't like that. Let's see, how do we use the match expression here? So here we have ordering less. So this is because it's comparing this. Underscore is any other case. Do you know? Ah, so let's see. Great call. So Crosbo is saying that the other we can use underscore to match any other case. So this is similar to other functional languages. This is similar to something like uh, I've seen an Elixir or Elm, so that's pretty cool. I wonder why this is complaining. So here we'll print not divisible by this. Let's copy this. Oh, we forgot three. Put that in here. Ah, yes. Good call. You need comma between matches. You make a great point. Number is divisible by three. Thank you, Crosby. You've been very helpful. Appreciate it. So you see here, we have commas after. So we can get rid of this, get rid of this, comma, get rid of that, move this up here, comma, get rid of that, move this up here comma, get rid of that, get rid of that, move this up here, comma. And we have our indentation all messed up. Let's fix that. I don't know why I went back to two. And now we have, let's see, so here, comma separated, so you can see that here, so that's what we kind of copied there. And here we have code box because we wanted multiple lines, and we could have done the same thing here to not extend it too long, but I think it's okay. And so now we just gotta find out what this wants here. Let's see, do we do match number? Let's try calling it and see if the compiler gives us a better kind of message here. So let's try calling this. So we'll say,
let's delete this code here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say um, y, let's say 25 is divisible by, and then we'll call divisible by, and we'll pass it 25. And so if we look here, let's see. Ah, so it's saying that what it's returning, and that's probably because of the error that we have, but we can also specify here. It's because it doesn't return anything, right? It's just printing. So what we'll do is we'll just call divisible by five, 25. And let's see what uh, our compiler is gonna complain about. So let me move myself over here. And I'm gonna clear this out and run compile uh, target run. See what happens. All right, cargo run. So here it's just giving us the same thing. Could not compile functions, right? Um, expected this, this, or this, right? So let's see. So it didn't expect this symbol. It expected a start of a function or an if statement. So let's see. Oh. I know why. I believe. It's likely because we need to. So right now it's matching on number. And so here, like you can see, it's matching on the evaluation of this, right? So whatever this is, it's gonna say if it's less, if it's greater than. Here, we're actually matching on number, so we're not actually leveraging number here, so we're, we're just matching on its value. So what we wanna do, let's see. Number. So it's a weird case for this because we are doing actually like modulo four, modulo two, whereas actually we want to match on like the expression. So we'd say, you know, figure out what the remainder is. It'd be more useful in some case like where we have multiple different string options. We want to check what the value is. I don't know if it's actually going to work in this case because again, we're not going to actually, it's not actually matching on number. If we were checking the exact value of number, like if number, let's say we did number mod, we would want to do that expression here. So like number mod four, and then we can check, does it equal zero, right? Does the, the value of this equal zero? And we'd actually want to use a comparator. So I'm not totally sure how to do this. So let's give it for now, it's worth a shot. And I think we'll learn more about match statements later. Um, but hey, Word the shot to see how it works. For now, we would just leverage our if statement. So we'll go back to that. But cool to try it out. I think here, the way this worked is again, we had this kind of ordering of less greater than equal to. Um, so I think as we get more into match statements, we'll figure out how to better employ them for this type of thing. But for now, let's leave it off. All right, so pretty cool. Uh, when the program executes, it's going to check the if expression. So it's going to do that evaluation. Using if in a let statement, because if is an expression, we can use it on the right side of a let statement. So in a, as a one line, so kind of like a ternary. So that's pretty cool. So let's try that out here. So we'll say, let number equal I have an idea, let's do um, let is positive equal if, I'm gonna make a number up here, let number equal five, if number greater than or equal to zero, true, else false. I wonder if there's a cleaner way to write this. Maybe there's like a nice ternary that we can use here. I don't know. Um, but let's try this out. So scroll up there so you can see that. So let is positive 
and then we'll do print ln the value of is positive is and I'll just comment out some of these so that we don't have to see them. Clear that out and I'll run cargo run. The value of is positive is true. And if I change it to negative, value of is positive is false. So pretty neat. Awesome. We're getting close to 11. Let's see, I think we can finish through the if statements, I hope. Oh, there's looping. Let's see how far we can get. We got four minutes. So that's our conditional, one line conditional, pretty cool. Um, you can see here, in this case, we're trying to return a different type. So remember the box code evaluate to the last expression in them and numbers by themselves are also expressions. In this case, the value of the if expression depends on which block of code executes. This means the value that have the potential to be results from each arm of the if statement must be of the same type. So here we're mixing a numerical type, right, an integer and a string. And so that's why this code wouldn't compile. So they have to be of the same type. So the arms have to all return the same type. You can't change the type based on conditional. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. The expression in the if block evaluates to an integer, and the expression in the else block evaluates to a string. All right, loops. Let's start off loops, and then whatever we don't finish today, we'll get to in the next uh, next chapters. So repetition with loops. It's often useful for executing a block of code more than once. So we've seen the basic loop, right? We saw that in our guessing game, our basic loop with the break. Let me just go ahead and, right? We have our loop here, um, our code running here, and then a continue when we want to continue, and a break to actually break out of the loop. They're running an infinite loop here. We're not going to run that. Um, return values from loops. So we, we saw here we can actually return a value. Here we just broke out, but you can actually return a value here. One of the use of loop is to retry an operation you know might fail, such as checking whether a thread has completed its job. However, you might need to pass the result of that operation to the rest of your code. To do this, you can add the value you want returned after the break expression you use to stop the loop. That value will be returned out of the loop so you can use it as shown here. So break counter plus two. So it's kind of like saying return and that's why it's okay to have the semicolon because similar to using return, we can put that semicolon there. So pretty cool. I like that. Before the loop, we declare a variable named counter and initialize it to zero. Then we declare a value named result and hold the value returned from the loop. On every iteration loop, we add one to the counter variable and then check whether the counter is equal to 10. Once it is, we break with that counter times two. So pretty cool. Let's try that out. So we'll go to our functions, create a new function here called um, count to 10. And it's going to take nothing, but it's going to return unsigned 32 bit let's say for now and so we'll do let you counter just like they have here equals zero let result equal loop we're starting our loop and it's going to actually store that result there and again this is an expression so counter plus equal so we're seeing plus equal for the first time here that's just like javascript where it's basically equivalent to counter equals counter plus one right and semicolon and then if counter equals equals 10 then we'll break put on a new line it looks like oh and also my if you notice my spaces are all wacky again we'll go with four and let's clean this up so we'll do break and we'll do counter times two so it's actually gonna return 20. There we go. And then we'll print ln. The result is results. All right. And let's call count to 10 up here. Count to 10. I'm also going to just fix these. Count to 10. And so here you'll see 
Um, it's expecting it to return. We're actually not returning anything. And so now it stopped complaining. And so I'm gonna clear this and I don't need to move my camera. You should be able to see it. Cargo run. Oh, did not compile. It's saying that expected an expression. Ah, I used three equals because I've been using JavaScript for so long. Womp womp. So let's clear that out and run it again. No JavaScript style, just regular. The result is 12. Ah, because I'm using plus two instead of times two, which would make the result 20. Pretty cool. Pretty cool, I think. So there we go. So there we used our first loop conditional loops with while. So while this is another loop many of you will be familiar with if you've done loops. It's basically while a condition is true. Um, evaluate, keep going, keep going, keep going. So we continue going till we break out. So in this case, what we have here is a number and it's saying while that number is not zero, uh, print the number and then subtract one from it. So it's a countdown. So let's let's do this. I like this. Let's make a function called countdown. And we're going to say countdown from, and it's going to take a number, and it'll be an unsigned 32-bit integer because we want it to be signed. We don't want to count down from negative. Not doing that. You're not doing that. Let's go. Um, so we're going to say let. We're going to say um, while x does not equal zero. And look, I'm using a a font with ligatures. That's why I get that nice out there. Print ln. And we're gonna do, oh, I like that. They're doing this, this is cool. Number, so it's gonna be like five, four, you know, whatever you put in, it'll be pretty cool. And we're gonna subtract, we're gonna do number minus equals, just like saying number equals number minus one, we're gonna say number minus equals one. And then here, um, one thing to note is we're not using number, we're using X. And I wonder if it's going to complain uh, that we're modifying x and haven't declared that x is mutable. Ah, yes. There's a nice, so Crosbo said here, there's a nice thing in Rust where you name a loop. So in nested loops or four blocks, you can break or continue on wanted loop, but it's rarely used. Interesting. So you can name a loop and break out of a specific named loop. That's pretty cool. I wonder if they're going to cover that. Crosbo's got the awesome tips. Crosbo, thank you so much. It's a, it's great having having you know someone here who's used the language. It's pretty pretty awesome to hear your tips. So I really appreciate that. So it's saying X is immutable. Um, I wonder how we can declare X is mutable. Maybe by just calling it. Maybe when we call it, it'll infer it. Let's find out. If not, what we can do is we can say let number e let mute number equal x and then we can use number that's a safe way i think cool so let's try calling it let's count down from what what are we going to count down from let's count down from five we don't want to get too crazy we don't have that much time left we're over time already so let's comment this out we're going to do countdown from 10. And I'm gonna clear this. Cargo run. Bam, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Blast off, let's go. Pretty awesome. Pretty cool, and even that, yeah, they actually added lift off here, which I like that, we should add that too. Uh, so I'll do that, yeah. Print ln lift off. Pretty great, that's cool. So just classic while loop. Looping through collection with four. So here we have a for loop. We're we'll using iterator. I think, let's see, we're a little bit over. We're at 1105. Let's see how much we have left. Let's just continue. We're almost done. Let's finish this chapter up. If you're with me, let's go. Let's do it. We're not that much over, and we're at four loops already. Looping with four. So you could use the while construct to loop over elements of a collection such as an array. For example, let's look at three, four. So here, looping over elements of an array. Here the code counts up through the elements in the array. It starts an index. So we've seen this. We don't tend to use while loops. We usually reach for something different like a for loop. Uh, here the code counts up through the elements in the array. It starts at index zero and then loops up, loops until it reaches the final index in the array. 
that is when index is less than five and is no longer true. Writing this code will print every element in the array. So pretty cool, we're doing it there. All five array values appear in the terminal as expected. Even though index will reach a value of five at some point, the loop stops executing before trying to fetch the sixth value from the array. But this approach is error prone. We could cause the program to panic if the index is incorrect, right? If it's out of bounds. It's also slow because the compiler adds runtime code to perform the conditional check on every element on every iteration through this loop. As a more concise alternative, we can use a for loop and execute some code for each item in a collection. A for loop looks like the code in listing 3.5. So using an iterator, and we can use a for loop. That's pretty awesome. So let's try changing blast off or, or countdown. Or let's try saying, um, yeah, let's do countdown, but we'll actually just have it <coughs> set to 10. Countdown, let's do countdown from five and we'll specify an array of five. <coughs> so what we'll do is we'll say let numbers equal one, two, three, four, five. And then we'll do four number in numbers dot iter. That's gonna be our iterator. And we're just gonna say print ln and we're gonna do the same thing we're gonna say. In fact, we actually wanna do it backwards. So I wonder, look at that, reverse. Now we'll reverse, let us iterate though. What is it saying here? No method iter found on unit type. Ah, so we'll do numbers. Check this out. We're gonna use shadowing. Let numbers equal numbers dot reverse so i guess reverse doesn't return anything let's see reverse let's see what it does just because i mentioned it reverse the order of elements in the slice in place ah in place interesting so it does it in place. That's not gonna work for us. No, no. So here, yeah, what we'll do is we'll just change this back to, change this to count to five. <laughs> so we don't have to reverse that, right? Cause it'll be a pain. Um, and we will pass it number. So now we have a loop that's gonna count to five just cause I was too lazy to reverse manually line 69, the numbers array. And we're gonna call countdown from five here. Down to five. So Crosbo with the tips, you need to make the first number mutable and then use reverse. Yes, it, so I, I imagine since it said I, it reversed it in place that it would have to be mutable. And so I wasn't gonna get to use my awesome shadowing technique. Um, so instead we'll just go with this. But yes, if I made it mutable, I should be able to reverse it since it's an in place mutation. Which feels kind of weird for me. I don't wanna do it in place, you know. Um, all right, so let's do cargo run. One, two, three, four, five. Awesome, so we just used our for loop. When we run this code, we'll see the same output in listing three, four. More importantly, we've now increased the safety of our code and eliminated the chance of bugs that might result from going beyond the end of the array, the out of bounds, right? So that's pretty often, often. I think it's awesome. The safety and conciseness of for loops make them the most commonly used loop construct in Rust. Makes sense. It's much nicer syntax than JavaScript, that's for sure. Using that dot iter, I like it. Even in situations in which you wanna run some code a certain number of times, as in the countdown example, use the while loop for that countdown, most of stations would use a for loop. The way to do that would be to use a range. So you can create an array of a certain length and just loop over that. So if you wanna loop over something five times, you create a, an array of length five using a range and then just loop over that, which is a type provided by the standard library that generates all numbers in sequence starting from the number and ending before another. So we could change one through five to be a range from one to five. Pretty cool. Here's what countdown will look like using a for loop and another method we've not yet talked about, rev, the reverse, to reverse the range. Whoa, rev, look, that's a range. There you go. That's it, that's what we want. Let's change it. Let's change this back to countdown from, let's actually make a new function this way we have it. And we're gonna say countdown from five and we're gonna do numbers, we're gonna do a range. So we're gonna go one to five and we're gonna call dot rev on it to reverse it. 
and we're going to loop over numbers. So in this case, it's saying, oh, we're just going to do forward number in this. We'll get rid of this, paste this here. So we have our range one to five, and it's going to be counted down from five because we reversed it. And let's go ahead and add that lift off back in there. Awesome. All right, now let's try running countdown from five. All right, cargo run. Four, three, two, one. That's because we only went to five, which is probably exclusive. So let's go to six, meaning the first one's inclusive. The first bound, the second bound must be exclusive. So now we should actually get five, four, three, two, one. Lift off. Awesome. Code is a bit nicer, isn't it? All right. Well, we're a little over and we're at the end. So let's read the summary here. You made it. That was a sizable chapter. Awesome work, everybody. You learned about variables, scalar and compound data types functions, comments, if expressions, loops. We did for loops, we did while loops, we did it all. If you wanna practice with the concepts discussed in this chapter, try building programs to do the following. Convert temperature between Fahrenheit and Celsius, that could be cool. Generate the nth Fibonacci number, oh, pretty cool. Print the lyrics to the Christmas character, car uh, Carol, the 12 days of Christmas. Yo, that would take, that'd be kind of a lot of typing. Taking advantage of the repetition of the song. That'd be a cool practice problem though. Maybe we'll try, we should try these out, uh, maybe on our next next uh, session. When you're ready to move on, we'll talk about a concept in Rust that doesn't commonly exist in other programming languages, ownership. So I'm excited to get into the ownership because it is a new concept, so it should be pretty cool. Crosbow in the chat. One dot dot equals five is one to five is the other solution. Ooh, very cool. So there is a way to get it to be inclusive with that equal sign. Thank you, Crosbow, for the awesome tips. My contact on my left eye is irritating me. <laughs> so apologies if my eyes all red. But that's it, everybody. We did it. Uh, we did chapter three. So what we'll do next time is we'll kick it off learning about ownership, which as we can see here is chapter four. So I'll post this up on GitHub. I'll post what we did here today. I'll clean this up a little bit, get it posted up there. Um, I will also post this session onto YouTube Check out the YouTube channel. Again, if you missed the first two chapters, they're here. I'll be adding the third chapter tonight. It'll be uploaded by tomorrow morning in HD. Thanks again for hanging out. I appreciate you hanging, even though we went a little bit over, but I'm glad we are able to wrap up chapter three. Thanks to everyone in the chat who participated. We got Dozeboy, Part-Time Lover, Crossbow, Pacow, Clam Watson. Who else is in there? We got Data Dog came in for a little bit. So definitely appreciate you popping by. If you like what you see, you can follow me on Twitch. You can subscribe on YouTube to get updates when we post the videos. But thank you for coming by. And hope to see you again. Again, we'll be doing it Tuesdays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. every Tuesday, unless somehow noted. Check me out on Twitter. You can follow me there. You'll get updates when the stream goes live. You can catch the YouTube link below. That's where we'll be going and posting the code here. And then check out YouTube. Subscribe on YouTube if you like what you see, and you'll be updated when new videos are posted. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for learning Rust with me. We're going to continue this next Tuesday with Chapter 4. So hope to see you there. Have a good night.